do want to say welcome to everybody who is joining us here at the Bridge Community Church for this Good Friday service. We look forward to this next hour of worship and reading the scripture and hearing God's word. We want to let you know that in advance, uh, we're going to be closing out this time with communion. So even while we're worshiping and reading the scripture, we want to encourage you to maybe have a family member go grab some juice and some bread so that you can be a part of the communion service today. But we want to begin this Good Friday. We're going to be reading portions of scripture and then singing a song that is reflective of that type of, of scripture that we read. We'll be mainly focusing from the Gospel of John with a few passages out of the Gospel of Matthew. So today I want to begin in John chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Pilate heard this and brought Jesus out, he sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone of Pavement which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Now the world awaits 
your presence and this power is within us we will rise to be your witness spirit come spirit come pour it out let your love run this assurance spirit come spirit come spirit come spirit come pour it out let your love run over here and now let your glory divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home.
had now been finished and so the scripture would be fulfilled Jesus said I am thirsty a jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus's lips when he had received the drink Jesus said it is finished with that he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it was given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Sing our judge. Our judge and our defender. 
John chapter 19, starting in verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and stripes of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Matthew 27, starting in verse 62, says, The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, and after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answers. Go make sure uh, the tomb is secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard.
taking off the rocket and all that rocket cross my salvation lay your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to me thank you for what this day means to us as followers of Jesus. We want to thank you, Jesus, for what you did on our behalf. Today, we not only just reflect, we celebrate the fact that you were crucified for our sins, and then three days later, were risen from the dead. I pray that this time of worship, I pray the word as it is taught will encourage and lift us up, Jesus, especially during this time that we face not only as a nation, but God, literally the world faces a crisis. You're still the answer today as you were 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We want to thank you for joining us here at the bridge today for Good Friday, celebrating the death of our, res our, of our Lord and Savior. And then in a few more days, we'll be having Easter and we'll be celebrating the resurrection. But today is a day when we reflect upon the death of Christ and what it means. We've been going through the book of John here at the bridge. And today I'm going to continue with that by staying in the context of the gospel of John as it presents the story of the death and then later the resurrection of Jesus. And I think it's interesting how the gospel of John presents the death of Jesus. We read those scriptures today when we were doing the singing. We were doing some reflective readings along with those, uh, those songs. And I want to just point out something that we've been looking at in this gospel because he points out some very important things about why he told the stories that he did. And if you've compared the, the account of the death and the crucifixion of Jesus to the other accounts, you know that he doesn't present any conflicting information that is presented in the other three Gospels, but he does give us some unique insights and a very unique perspective. And he says that the reason he does that is in John 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
Now I'm aware that many of you have been exposed and, are, and have heard the teachings regarding Easter and the resurrection of Christ and how that proved that he was the son of God. But what I want to emphasize today is how the death and, and crucifixion of Jesus, the punishment, the trial, was proof that he was the son of God. It wasn't just the resurrection. It was also his crucifixion and his death was proof. What he went through for us. And so as we look at the Gospel of John, here's a couple things that I want us to reflect on as we prepare ourselves for communion because that's what communion is. Communion is, it is celebrating the death and resurrection. So being Good Friday, we're emphasizing the death and crucifixion of Christ. What I want you to see in the, in the account of Jesus' life in this regards is this. Jesus had face, faith in the face of betrayal. We read in John chapter 18, verse 3, So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus had one of his, one of his own twelve, somebody he had invested in for three years of his life, three years of ministry. He had watched the miracles begin to have a different agenda than what Jesus had. He wanted to manipulate Jesus' power for political purposes and for military gain. And so he betrayed Jesus. But we read that Judas wasn't the only one. In John chapter 18, verses 26 and 27, when Jesus was in the garden and when he was arrested and then he was being tried, we read that the apostle Peter had, was being approached. And one of the passages in John says this, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the third time that Peter had denied Jesus in that short evening. And what I want you to notice here in the story is this. The faith that Jesus had helped him to be bear that betrayal. How does that apply to us? Well, I think we all have experienced some level of betrayal. We've all had a friend who's disappointed us. Maybe we've all had a, a family member who's disappointed us. But I know that some people have experienced a depth of betrayal that you can only understand if you yourself had experienced that. The, the, a marriage that dissolved, somebody that you said, till, till death us do part, and they changed their mind. Not, not because you did, they changed it. And even though maybe you wanted something to work out, they said, I don't want it to work out. And there wasn't anything that you could do about it. Can I just tell you, as difficult, and as even, I'll, I'll even say this, as awkward it is to talk about things like that, can I tell you our faith in Jesus works in that context too? That he helps a person who has experienced the deepest forms of betrayal keep their bearings, keep their mind, keep their spirit that doesn't mean they don't experience the wounds but sometimes all Jesus does for you is he just helps you to keep your grip and he just holds you together Jesus' spirit one was deviant one of his disciples was deviant in what he did the other had all the best intentions of the world and just crumbled and just fell apart he didn't mean to betray Jesus in a, in a time of human weakness, he just fell apart. But I want you to notice this. Jesus did not fall apart. His faith worked for him in the face of betrayal. Another example of how Jesus' faith worked for him in this context is Jesus had faith in the face of injustice. We all have a mentality that the court exists to clear our names 
if we've been unjustly accused, if we've been, uh, something has been said about us or an accusation has been made, we all have that hope that, well, at least if it goes to court, there's a, there's a judicial system that is balanced. Uh, even the symbol in our own nation is a lady with a blindfold and she's holding the scales of justice. And supposedly only the evidence will determine whether a person is innocent or guilty. There's no bias, but you don't have that in this story. Jesus not only suffered betrayal, he suffered injustice. A court that should have cleared his name played along with it. In verse 38 through 40 of John chapter 18, Pilate says this, what is truth, retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at, a, at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. This court was, was beyond crooked. It was, it was corrupt. He even said, I find no basis for a charge against him. None. And political pressure, religious pressure, caused Pilate to pronounce, listen to this, Jesus wasn't getting three to five years, he was getting a death sentence. He was getting a death sentence. And so the very court that should have cleared him was, was unjust. And again, I'm not naive to think that every single person who has ever been convicted of anything in our nation, that it's 100% sure they're all guilty. We all hear stories of people who have been cleared five, 10, 15, 20 years later, sometimes just from somebody finally testifying that knew something or a DNA test, the list is, it's, it's monumental the number of stories that have come out. I'm not here to charge our system with problems, but maybe you're a person who's listening to me right now and you go, I'm one of those. Maybe you've already served your time and you've gotten out. Maybe you were accused of something at work and you didn't do it, but because of how the system worked, they said you're guilty, you're fired, you're dismissed. Maybe you're a person who's been accused of something and you said, man, I didn't do that. But the wheels of, of, the, of the organization went in such a way that you paid a price and you go, I didn't do it, I didn't say it. I never committed those acts. And I can, you know, most of us would say, I can understand if you turned your heart away from God because of those kinds of things. But can I tell you, I think it should be just the opposite. You ought to turn your heart towards God because of those things. You say, why is that? Because Jesus knows exactly what it's like to sit in a courtroom and, to be, and be declared guilty. And he's going, I am totally innocent. I didn't do that. He understands it. I wouldn't think that you would run from Jesus. I think you would run to him because you have a God who understands injustice. I would think he would be your best friend. I'm not saying you're gonna get your name cleared. I'm not even gonna say, hey, Jesus still was executed. But we, we see in the story he didn't take it out on God. In fact, you see that Jesus used his faith to draw closer to God because of injustice. I would say this, there's probably people who have suffered minor injustices in life, moderate, and there might be folks listening today, you have suffered significant injustice. All I can tell you is this, you have a God who totally gets where you're at. And I believe he has a faith. 
I believe he can have a relationship with you that will help you through that crisis. Another thing that we see, I think, in Jesus' life relates to this in, this in this time of being tried and then crucified. Jesus had a faith in the face of abuse. We read in John chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now get this. And they slapped him in the face. So there's two aspects that are going on right here in this abuse. Not only is it physical abuse, it is emotional and mental abuse. They're just, they're just not taking physical action against Jesus. They are, they are going after him. They're going after his mind, his spirit, his personhood. Many of us, whether it be through the media or even through personal relationships, we've all probably been aware of somebody who was suffering abuse in a particular context. And we, we didn't know what to tell them. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know what to do. There might have even been a need for law enforcement to be called in. And sometimes people hang in those kinds of contexts to the point it begins to damage them and it begins to destroy them. And I've had conversations, they'll say, where was God in the face of my abuse? You don't understand, you've never been through that. You've never had that happen to you. And I go, you're absolutely right, but I've got a wonderful testimony for you of somebody who has been through that and they can help you come out the other side. And they go, oh really, who's that? And I always open up the Bible to this story and say, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. He was abused physically and he was abused mentally and emotionally. And I said, and here's the thing, you're frustrated because you were powerless to do anything about it. You were in a context that even sometimes if you wanted to do something, you couldn't, you were powerless. You were overwhelmed by whatever was happening in the room. Jesus was in a position, man, he could have called 10,000 angels and just handled the context real quick. But his faith helped him in the face of the abuse that he even cared for those who were abusing. And I said, later on, you read in the text, Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. That's a faith that works in everyday life. I am by no means saying that abusers ought to get a pass in life. But sometimes we know until law or justice or something can happen, an intervention, people are suffering in pain and abuse and difficult context. And hopefully one day something happens in an interventional way that rescues them, that helps them, that saves them from the context. But till then, can I tell you that if you are a person in that trap, your faith is not silent. Your faith still works there. We're not given a pass to those who are responsible for what they do. But I'm telling you, you need to know when you say, where are you, Jesus? I can tell you, he'll say right here with you because he's been there, done that. And more importantly, he can help you to be ready to come out the other side. Because I'm here to tell you, there's going to be an other side to all this stuff that sometimes happens to people's lives. The last thing I want us to look at before we get into communion, Jesus had a, a faith in the face of death. In, J in John chapter 19, verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's pretty interesting. There are other sayings that are associated with Jesus on the cross. And when you put all the Gospels together, you get a pretty clear picture of the variety of things that Jesus was saying while he was on the cross. 
But this piece right here, I think is interesting, it is finished. The Son of God knew there was a day to wrap it all up. The very guy who was talking about eternal life and all those kinds of things, the very man who said he embodied eternal life recognized that in this life there is a day when it all has to finish. And I say that to every one of you watching today. If Jesus tarries, every one of us is going to have to cross a finish line to go into eternity. And my challenge to you is this. Is your faith such that you can look death square in the eye and recognize that death will not be the end, but death will be a doorway to a new beginning. Yeah, without Jesus, it's the end all, that's it. But with your faith in Christ, it's a doorway to a new dimension, a new life, a new eternity. And Jesus had a faith that in the face of death, I'll just say this, he didn't sweat the big details. He didn't even sweat the small stuff because he knew death was a transition. I like what the Apostle Paul says in, in the book of, of Galatians. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Translated into Americanism, win-win. Win-win. If he lets me go on living, I get to live for him. If he decides that today is my last day, I get to go home. Or another way to say this is, you get to go home or you get to go home. It's one of the two. Listen, our faith doesn't dismiss the seriousness of the challenges that we face in life. Our faith puts them in a different perspective and it gives us a different understanding. We have a lot of the same challenges that other people have. But because of our walk with Jesus, we have a different perspective. We have a different definition. We have a, a, a different view of things. And I'm gonna wrap this up. This coronavirus, I know I've heard, I've heard from enough people this. People miss other people now. I mean, they miss being around other people. And I was sharing this with somebody the other day. I said, I've had the ability to be around the world and be in some closed countries. And experience where Christians had to risk their life just to go to a gathering of believers. And, you know, your natural comment is, why would you risk your life to go join a group of believers? You know, why don't you just stay home, worship Jesus in your, in your house with your own family, play it safe, and everybody will leave you alone. I go, no, 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 it's absolutely crucial that I go gather with other believers. And they literally, I mean, they risk their life to go to a gathering in an attic of somebody else's house or some obscure place. And now that we're in this particular context, you start to understand why some people would risk everything. I'm not saying that we do that right now because of the virus, but can you imagine being denied human contact with other people? Not because there was a virus, but because, quote, somebody said you can't be around them. And you start to, you, you start to see the longing and the tugging in your own heart of, Man, I just want to be around other people. I just want to see them. I just want to talk to them. I want to embrace them. I want to, I want to, I want to experience life together. Now you start to understand why people around the world and some other countries are willing to risk everything they have just to go be around somebody of like faith. We have the same problems. We just have a different definition to them. We handle them different. We have a different perspective. Someone asked the where you're at right now, if you would, if you have a piece of bread, I'm going to ask you to hold this up if you would. 
And we're going to have a time of communion together and close this out. But before we transition to sing a song that I think many of you will be familiar with, I want you to hold up that piece of bread. And I understand that piece of bread may have come out of the, a loaf in the fridge or in the cupboard, and you're like, I don't know if this, let me tell you something. It might be a cracker. I don't, listen. This is symbolic of what we're, of what we're doing. The, the bread symbolizes the body of Christ. But in doing this, we experience the personhood and presence of Jesus. I'm here to tell you that piece of bread in your hand, that cracker in your hand, is a, is a point of contact with Jesus. Lord, as we hold whatever form of bread we hold right now, as we reflect on what this time of the year is, Jesus, let your personhood become real to every person who hears the sound of my voice right now. I pray whatever context they're in, the presence of Jesus come into the room. I pray God a tangible, not just something filling somebody's head, but filling their heart. We eat together now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's eat the bread together. Now I want you to hold up whatever kind of juice you have, whatever you found that is available to you. But I want you to recognize that what you hold in your hand represents the blood of Christ. Jesus, you said to do this in remembrance of you. And this, this juice, this cup that we hold represents your blood. And the reason we do that is because the blood of Jesus is what forgives us. It is the shed blood of Jesus that is also the, the uh, means of being healed physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And I pray, God, for whatever people need that are listening right now, that the presence of Jesus would show up and bodies would be healed, minds would be set right, broken hearts would begin to be mended. I pray, God, for your presence in whatever place, in whatever location somebody is. Jesus, do what you only can do. And we drink together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to close this service out. I'm going to ask Pastor Malik and the worship team to come. We're going to sing a song. and After we've sang it a little bit, I'm going to come back up and say the blessing. But come on, I think many of you will know the lyrics to this song. Come on, lift your voice wherever you're at. Don't watch us sing it. Join with us as we sing it. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace. It was grace that promised.
Bless the work of your hands at home, at work, at church, in this community. May he bless your coming and your going. May the Lord grant the enemies rising up against you be defeated. When they come at you in one direction, let them flee from you in seven directions. May the Lord send a blessing on everything you put your hand to do. May he continue to establish you as his holy people. May all people see that you have been called by the name of the Lord. May the Lord grant you prosperity, opening up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty. May he bless the work of your hands. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever you're at, say amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to seeing you on Easter. His mercy reigns, unending love. Amazing grace, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed.